name is this? Jehoshiba. Jehoshiba! <laughs> you know what? You're close. <laughs> How's this name actually pronounced for those of us who are fast English? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? Jehoshiba? <laughs> Jehoshiba. <laughs> actually, Jehoshiba is actually pretty solid. That's a solid guess. That's actually why I first pronounced the, the tabernacle, the tabernacle. That's 100%. <laughs> I, that's what, I just tabernacle. thought it flowed like Jehoshiba, not Jehoshiba or tabernacle. I just was like, that's just drawn it out. Just called it tabernacle. It's pretty self explanatory. But it's not tabernacle, uh, in case you didn't know that. It is uh, tabernacle, yes. Jehoshiba. Jehoshiba. Jehoshiba is how you pronounce her name. And Jehoshiba is in what book of the Bible? Who remembers this? I'm getting real specific. Yeah. Second King! Tyler gets his gold star. We should make a poster for that. Should I make a gold star poster? No. So that is who we have been discussing, and that is who we'll be diving into again this week. So hopefully you all have had a, a good week this past week. Hopefully you all remember a little bit about what we discussed last week. Tyler doesn't because he just goes in one ear and out the other, but he'll remember one day. He'll take notes. Yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll remember the Bible. He remembered one thing, so I'm, I'm actually surprised about that. But hopefully this week of school is at least better than the last one. Everyone's in school now, right? You at least started? No. no? Not, not yet? Some oh, of you and some of you aren't? Like school. Oh, what? Like school? I slept through all of it. You're still not in, are you? That's no, right. Know. You were the one who started like super late. She I started. Didn't My I'm so Lord, look who it is, Miss Kennedy. How you doing? Good to see you. How you doing, Senor? Good to see you. Good to see you. Look at our friends in. So, have you guys started school? Is that how many? How many? Like, okay. So, what, what district are you in? I haven't started school. But I haven't started school. Oh, you went to school too. You just started. That's what it was. Yeah. Goodness gracious. That's ridiculous. I don't know. How some people start school and how some people have it. That's a little ridiculous. Well, Wisconsin's not about third school. Like, it's crazy how some state by state. That's why really Wisconsin's stupid. No, I have no idea. Maybe. I have no idea. But I know we asked uh, last week, we asked a lot of people what the worst class in school to take is. And a lot of people sided with math. I get that. Yes. I get math. I was like, math ain't the worst. There are a lot, there are a lot, a lot of other classes that aren't the worst. But I will say, from this week, I see why math, again, is a very hated subject, because as someone who has at least taken online college courses, I'm at the part in the bachelor's degree where I've got to get ready to take core classes and you have to take assessments so they know where to put you. So it's not even you have to pass this. It's just we want to know how dumb you are when it comes to math, so we need to know how easy to make it for you. And I can't even pass the assessment. So this is getting real rough here, people. <laughs> Because I don't know what A divided by C is, I get put in like the lowest class of all time. And so I have no idea what I'm trying to figure out here, but it is incredibly hard. You don't know what that is? Thank you. It's two. Yes, of course it's two. Because A divided by C always equals two. Silly, silly. I have no idea. It's pretty awful. I will say math is getting really, really rough. But a lot of people are saying math is... Some people voted history, which you have a boring, boring history teacher. You ain't, ain't going to rebound off of that. History is god awful science, and terrible science, if, you science, science. if you have a very marketing. boring teacher. Marketing. Hand we're off good off marketing. <laughs> Tyler said art, and I was like, shame on you, bro. You see, you and Cody said art. I'm like, you telling me you'd rather go do math than just paint like Bob Ross. That is so sad. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard. I'd rather do long division than draw a picture of a snowman. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard. That's so sad. I don't understand. But hopefully you all do well in school. Hopefully you pass your terrible art classes, and uh, we'll see if you go from there. If you don't, you deserve to redo your grade. I'll say that. You can't pass art. You should stay back a little. Work on work on those drawing skills. I don't but have art. You don't have art? Me either. You don't have don't art, but you much. already know you hate it. You are that guy. You are just that guy who just likes to rain on everyone's parade. That's fine, Tyler. That's fine. All right. So as we go into our study this week, as we continue the story of Jehoshaphat, what did Jehoshaphat tell us about God? There was one specific aspect of God that Jehoshaphat talked about. What was that aspect? Who remembers? Who remembers? It's not like it's written right under her name or anything, but... God's redemption. Holy crap. Yes, God's redemption is what we talked about. Jehoshaphat's story and life talks a lot about God's redemption. Why does it talk about? Who remembers? Because she's only brought up once in the Bible. Who can just give me a gist of what Jehoshaphat's story is? What does she do that is so amazing in the Bible? It's only in one chapter. Wait, Jehoshaphat is a seed. A she. A she. Yeah. I was like, a she? I'm like, no, it's not a body of water that we are talking about right now. Yes, it is a she. Jehoshaphat. No, no, we, we talked about that last week too, though. It's fine. What does Jehoshaphat do? 
queen. Yes, there we go, Tyler. She saved one of the grandkids from an evil queen. So this evil queen tries to kill a bunch of babies to make sure that her family stays in the royal line and stays in power as long as they can. So she kills all the all the baby boys who are about to take king except one because Jehoshua takes one and hides him to make sure that he doesn't die. And so we talked about how this shows God's redemption in multiple ways and in multiple different levels. And so what we did to talk about this is we talked about a definition of redemption that Dr. John MacArthur has in biblical terms. And this is what he says about redemption in the Bible. He says, redemption in the Bible is when God sets his love on particular individuals, chose them to be saved from sin and death, and proposed that they would be restored to a right relationship with him through the redemptive work of his son applied by the Spirit. Now, this is a very complex definition, but we broke this down and said there are three big main things that we see all throughout the Bible, and specifically we see when God's redemption is in place, and that is his love, his saving, and his restoration. You can see God loving, God saving, and God restoring in every act of redemption throughout the Bible. You will see that every time God redeems his people. And so we noted this definition last week when we first opened up about Jehoshaphat, and we talked about how this is how God redeems throughout his word. And so this week we're going to talk about how God loves. We did a little bit of an overview last week of what Jehoshaphat's life stood for and how you saw God's redemption as a whole. And now we're breaking down each week his love, his saving, and his restoration every time God redeems. And so this week we are going to see how he loves his people in redemption. How does God continue to love when it seems like there is so much evil and so much wickedness that God even needs to redeem you from? And so we actually asked that small group, if you were with us at small group on Wednesday, some of you were, we asked that small group what one of the biggest things that what one of the biggest things in your life was where you needed God to redeem you that you just overlook all the time. And one of the questions we asked was in a specific manner was when has there been a time where God has loved you but you overlooked it simply because of how hard your life was or maybe God was loving you and helping you in a season of life and it was so hard to see and you overlooked it and glossed over it so quickly simply because of the evilness and wickedness that was around you and obviously there were multiple answers to this there are multiple answers that varied there were a lot of answers where it's like I can easily overlook this this and this when God interacts in my life but there are multiple times where God is good to me and I simply overlook it because I'm not aware of what God is doing as a matter of fact, I even shared a story of how when I was in Illinois, where I lived way before I moved to Wisconsin, when I lived in Illinois, I 100% doubted and was ready to call it quits on everything that I thought God had planned for me because of how bad I did at an internship at a church. There were so many things I was asked to do at a church in Illinois that I just absolutely failed at, and it was terrible, and I was totally ready to just be like, that's fine. I'll just work at Burger King the rest of my life because this is not going to work out how God wants this to work out. If I'm not good at this at this church, I'm not going to be good at this anywhere. And so I was ready to call it quits until I just knew God had continued to call me to do it. And it wasn't until I moved to Wisconsin that I realized why he brought me through so many hardships in that area because I was able to see myself grow in all of those areas that I was tested in just a few years later. And so we have a lot a lot of stories like that that we discussed on Wednesday and a lot more stories that we'd honestly have if we thought about it of when we were totally down, when hardships came our way, when we were surrounded by evilness, surrounded by depression, surrounded by wickedness, and we didn't see God. But when we take a few steps forward and we look back, we can see how God was with us all along and how he grew us in that. And that was a huge one for me. And so this may sound awesome and may even sound redundant when you read the Bible, or especially when you come to church, because the fact of the matter is even when God provides for us, even when God shows his mercy to us, even when he orchestrates our very lives, even though we can definitely see from the outside looking in that God is amazing and he does all these miraculous things in our lives, it is so easy to gloss over those because of the evilness and the wickedness and the hardships that are right in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis. Like you hear a lot of grateful old people say all the time, I'm just thankful today to God that I woke up. One day you're going to look back and be like, seriously though, I am thankful that every day I woke up. The fact that God has providently decided when I will come and when I will go is miraculous in and of itself. And the fact that I don't see that as a blessing every day of my life is something that one day 
I hope I'll see. One day you'll be like that. One day you will see that everything that God has done, looking back on your life, has been amazing. And you will be thankful for the things that God has done in your life. And so today I want us to take a deeper look at that love and how it is seen, not just in this story, but in our own personal lives. And so we're going to do that by looking at 2 Kings 11, verses 1 through 3 again. This is what we opened up with last week, and this is what we're going to quickly jot over in case we missed it or you weren't here last week. So this is what 2 Kings 11, 1 through 3 says. It says, When Athaliah, who is this evil queen trying to kill all these babies, it says, When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram and sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princes. So this is the kid that she rescues, who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse into a bedroom and hid him for, from Athaliah so that he was not killed. In verse 3, so he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah was reigning over the land. So again, we see such a hard situation take place where this evil queen is literally trying to murder babies to make sure they do not take over the throne one day, and yet we still see the love of God in this situation, even though it's so easily overlooked. Because here in verse 3, we see exactly why God's love is bursting through in this situation. Verse 3 again says, So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah was reigning over the land. Six years. She not only hid this child, but Jehoshaphat hid this child and the people taking care of him for six years. Six years is when she did this. The longest game of hide and seek ever, if you will, is when she did this with a kid and every other person taking care of this child. And this is absolutely ridiculous because if you know anything about children, they are some of the loudest, most curious most obnoxious people who have ever graced the face of the earth, and you're lucky if you can hide them for six minutes, all right? Some of you in this room can't even hide a secret for six minutes, let alone a kid for six years. This is absolutely miraculous right off the bat. That is, again, so easy to grace by and so easy to look over because we just read she, was hidden, she hid him and the baby for six years. It is so easy to read that and just gloss over the fact that God kept not just this baby safe, but Jehoshaphat safe and everyone taking care of this kid for six years in the exact same town that this evil queen was trying to kill them in. This is absolutely ridiculous and is another reason why you can see the hand of God over this situation and his love pouring out over his people because you cannot successfully hide a kid in the same town as the one who wants to kill him for six years under your own might and strength. It is just not going to happen. As much as you can say, I'm good with kids, or if you're just willing to be out there and humble yourself and be like, I'd be lucky if he lived five minutes. A lot of us are willing to admit there is no way without God's provision and without his help that we would be able to protect a family for six years under such evil authority. And that is exactly what he does. And so what's amazing about this is we come to a point where we realize that God is saving his people and God is with his people even in the midst of such evil. And we come to a point that we actually came to when we studied Elisha last month. Because Elisha, again, was under the same evil rulership and under the same evil kings. And we came to this point that I want to remind us of today, which is simply sometimes we really need to see how lost we are without God in order to fully understand how bad we need him. That is what this story is showing us right off the bat, is that the reason why there's so much evilness taking place and the reason why God allows it is because sometimes we need to see how bad, how evil, and how wicked the world is without God to understand how much we actually need him to redeem us. That is what is so amazing about this story. Yes, the love of God is on display, but without the evilness surrounding this story, you sometimes can forget how bad you really need God. And so these next few passages, while not in 2 Kings, back up and cross-reference 2 Kings beautifully. And this next one is right out of the book of Proverbs and enforces what we just read. It's Proverbs 21, verse 30, and it simply says this. It says, There is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. That's what it says, because that matches perfectly. 
Right away, you're probably thinking, what in the world does this have to do with God's love or redemption? Or how does this back up Jehoshaphat's story? And so let me ask you right away, how in the world does this verse show God's love in any way, shape, or form? It says, there's no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. How in the world does that show the love of God? Let me first off ask this. Is this verse for people who are with God or against the people who are against God? Against. against? Yes, it is against. We see that right at the end. It says there's no wisdom, no understanding, and no counsel against the Lord. So how does this passage, although being to the enemies of God, show the love of God? What do we think? Where is the good love of the Lord in a verse that is against evil people? What do we think? Why does this show the love of God? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Why is it good to know that evil people can't stop God? Let's start there, kindergartners. What's good about no evil person being able to stop God? Hey, Doc, come on. You know this answer. Dang, throw them there. What do we think? Tyler, you know this answer, too. I think everyone knows this answer. No one wants to say the answer. Yep. I really don't know. You have no idea about what's good about no. evil not being able to stop God. That's fine. That's fine. What do we think? What's good about evil not being able to triumph God? That is what I said. It's a very simple answer. I now, all, I now see why you all hate men. What do you think? Oh, sweet Lord. <laughs> this is not that. I didn't think this was going to stump every person in the room. What's good about evil not stopping God? My God is never going to. Okay, just say the question in reverse. That works. Yes, I mean, that is basically it. That God can never be stopped, but what's good for you that God can never be stopped? He always loves you. Ah, oh, there we go, because you're on whose side? The wicked people or God's? God. Ah, oh, thank you for attending my class. There we go! That is why. It is because God will never be stopped by evil, and that is good and shows his love to us because we are on God's side. I know this seems like just a common adage or just some com common saying, but we all need to understand that the reason why this is important is because it is telling us that there is no amount of evil that can stop God from doing what he wants. There's no amount of evil that we can commit. There's no amount of evil that this world and evil rulers can commit that will stop God from doing what he wants. Now, this is incredibly comforting because when we have been saved and redeemed by God, we can live in this peace that no matter what comes our way, nothing is going to stand against God. God. No matter what comes against us, no matter what may come against our freedom, no matter what may come against God himself, nothing is going to overthrow God from his throne. And that is an extremely comforting thing to be able to hold on to. It's almost what, like when your mom tells you no, you know there is nothing that you can do that's going to change that answer. You can say, dad told me yes, or I did a lot of chores, or maybe if I give you a hug and buy her some flowers, you'll change your mind. It ain't going to work. I don't know if you've tried bribery on your mom. Maybe your mom is more lenient than mine. But there's no amount of bribery that is ever going to change a mama's no from a no. When she says no, that's it. Matter of fact, if you bribe, she'll enjoy it and she'll go with it. But then she's like, you stupid, it's still a no. That is exactly what this is. You can try as much as you want to overthrow God. The evil people of this world can do all that they can to overthrow God. And he's smiling and saying, that's cute. It's never going to happen. Which shows God's love in a way that I think a lot of us may not understand. Because no one will ever be smart enough. No one will ever understand enough, and no one will ever gather enough people to form an entire council that will ever come close to overthrowing God and kicking him off his throne. And as ironic as it sounds, one of the most loving things that God can do is remind his people that there is not a single thing you can do to stop his plan. That is one of the most loving things he can remind his people is that, yes, Although I have to humble you and remind you how small and weak you are, there is nothing you can do and nothing anyone else against you and me can do that will ever stop my plan. And that is an extremely loving act of God that he shows us. Because God does what he wants when he wants to do it, and this is one of the most loving things he can do because he is reminding us that he is in charge and nobody else. They can try but no one else is ever going to overthrow God from his throne.
throne. And so the last passage we have is a cross-reference out of the book of Isaiah. And this is a prophecy of a man who is compared to the king who is saved in 2 Kings chapter 11. And so who do we think this man is being prophesied about in the book of Isaiah? Who do we think are we about to draw references from, from the book of Isaiah back to this cute little king in 2 Kings? I'll give you a hint. He's probably the most famous Bible character you can think of right now. Jesus. Yes, there we go. Because all the major and minor prophets prophesy about what king coming? Jesus. Look at that. There's a question he's not going to answer. Yes, Jesus. Jesus is who we have. He doesn't have his Christian chain on today, fellas. you got to give him a break. He's like, ah, I don't have my little Jesus swag. Yes, Jesus is who this passage is prophesying about. And it also ties into the tale of this king in 2 Kings chapter 11. And this is what it says. Isaiah 65, 8 through 9 says this. Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and, no, and one says, Do not destroy it, for there is benefit in it. So I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and an heir of my mountains from Judah. Even my chosen one shall inherit it, and my servants will dwell there. Now, there's a lot of symbolism and imagery in this passage, but basically what he is saying is a lot about what we just read, which is why I love this passage so much, because it ties together the love of God we see in 2 Kings 11 when he says he will bring forth an heir to deliver them. But it also shows that God ultimately is in control, just like Proverbs 21, when it says that God will not let everyone be destroyed. We see God loving his people and God providing for his people by being in control at the exact same time, just like we saw in these previous verses. And that is what God is saying through Isaiah to the nation of Israel when he makes this comparison to grapes in a wine press. That is why we see that first imagery right there when he says the new wine is found in the cluster and one says do not destroy it. That is what he is saying God does, is that all of us are going to be destroyed like grapes in a wine press one day, but because God is on our side and because we have been saved by him, we don't need to fear because God has said, do not destroy it. He has saved us and redeemed us, and he is over all the evil and over all the wickedness that will try to crush us but never will succeed. And so that is what that comparison is about. And so this story shows us the love of of God in redemption through the prophecy of Jesus, which I think we can quite honestly say that no story in the Bible shows the love of God in redemption quite like the story of Jesus. Just about no story in the Bible that you can find is going to match the redemptive power of the story of Jesus. You might be able to say, I found one that I think is more unique than Jesus, but even then I might argue with you and say, I don't know if it's more unique simply because I think you've heard the story of Jesus so many times that you forget again the power and the redemption that happens in the story of Jesus itself. But there is no amount of redemption in any story in the Bible that I can find that has a clearer picture of God's love than the redemptive story of Jesus. And so if you ever struggle ever struggle with seeing the love of God in your life, remember that the biggest act of love to ever be put forth on the face of the earth was that God made a way for sinners to be saved. If you ever question, does God love me? Is God's redemption in my life? How do I know God still redeems? The biggest way to answer that question is to remind yourself that the biggest act of love that has ever taken place and the history of mankind has been from God for sinners. It is God making a way for fallen people to be saved and brought back to him. And so if you have been redeemed by God and you don't see the love of God in your life, I can confidently say it is simply because you are not looking. Confidently say this. If you say you have been saved and you have been redeemed by God and you don't see the love of God in your life, I pray that your eyes are opened one day to that. But I can confidently say without a doubt it is simply because you do not see it, not because it is not there. Or as one of my favorite pastors, God rest his soul, R.C. Sproul says, what it means to be loved by God is that he will never ultimately forsake his people. To be loved by God means that he will never ultimately forsake his people.
people. And so I want to challenge all of us in this room today as we go throughout this week. I want you to open your eyes to the love of God. And I want you to pray that this week. It is one of the more humbling things we can pray, but also one of the most benefiting things that we can pray in our lives. When we come before God and say, God, I know I don't see everything that you're doing. I know I'm never in control of all that you're doing. I know I don't understand everything that you're doing, but I pray that my lack of wisdom and my lack of understanding would not leave me to gloss over the amazing things that you do in my life time and time again. So I encourage you, pray this week that God would open your eyes to see just how many different ways he loves you, cares for you, and provides for you because he has redeemed you. And so pray this over our lives and let us see how this leads us closer to him and how this leads us closer in our walk with him just as it led Jehoshaphat closer to him even in the midst of all the evil and wickedness she was surrounded with. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. We can close out. We'll play a few games in here. We can eat up the rest of the snacks or leave that to Enoch either or. And we will see when they end with service in a few minutes. So you got a problem with that? Is that okay? No, I said that. Oh, I thought you said, oh, oh man. I thought you just went, oh, no man. Why we got to do this? Cool. So let's pray, and then we'll head on out. God, we come before you this morning, and we thank you uh, that even in your word, in a story as short as the life of Jehoshaphat, that God, you can show us some amazing, amazing things with the plan of redemption that you have for your people. God, we love that as we read your word, as we go all throughout the Bible, that God, we can just see multiple ways and multiple areas of life where you continue to redeem your people because of how good, loving, and providential you are really are. And so God, I pray this week that you would just begin to open our eyes. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and let us be humbled, but God, let us also have our, our hearts and our eyes open to just the amazing things that you do in our lives each and every single day. God, the fact that we are saved, the fact that you made a way for a fallen human nature to come and rest with you for eternity, the fact that you have made a way for everyone to be saved through Jesus Christ is a miracle in and of itself. And I pray that you would show us things like that. You would give us the weight of things like that. You would open our eyes to the love of many gifts that you've given us in our lifetime so that we may understand just how much we need you and just how much you love us in our lives. So God, we pray that you would be with us. God, be speaking to us, be opening our eyes and be making us more like Jesus and less like ourselves as we go throughout this week. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.